back everybody to this video uh, lecture series for introduction to philosophy. In this video we're going to complete our discussion of Plato's Apology. And in this video we're going to be looking at many of the comments that Socrates makes towards the end of the speech which are going to really show us some of the main themes and main ideas that characterize the most important aspects of Socrates' thought. So on the one hand, what we're going to see is greater um, insight into why Socrates has such a fundamental commitment to philosophy. He gives us a couple reasons why, for him, it simply would go against who he is as a person, go against his integrity and his, his principles, to avoid death by stopping his practice of philosophy. And for that reason, he is perfectly willing to accept death if the only way he could avoid it was ceasing to do the activity which is characterizes his entire life which he believes is absolutely necessary for a good human life which is the practice of philosophy and at the same time he's also going to make some comments on the nature of death and these comments are important for a few reasons first he's going to show and in a sense imply this about the jury that the common attitude we have toward death of fear or the attitude of not wanting to accept death or being very afraid of death, that such an attitude is irrational. In large part, it comes from, one, not understanding the nature of death properly, and two, not understanding what's really important about life. And so to the extent that the jury thinks that he would ever accept a deal in which he could continue to live if he stopped practicing philosophy, to the extent that they think, they think that's a possibility, it just shows that they haven't fully thought through what is truly important about living a human life. At the same time, his comments on death are also meant to give comfort to his friends. Right, so during his speech at trial, not only were the jurors there, and of course his accusers who could be characterized as his enemies, but also his friend Plato and other wealthy young people who, who associated with Socrates. And they were, of course, distraught once the news came in, in the speech that he was convicted and would eventually be sentenced to death. And so his comments are also meant to give comfort to them, to, to remind them at the same time why death isn't necessarily the bad thing that we think it is. Okay, so to begin, I want to look back at the major argument that we looked at last time. And this is just my outline of Socrates' reasoning for why it is that he simply could not stop practicing philosophy just to please the jury and save his life. So the argument went like this. P1, one should never do what's shameful. P2, it would be shameful to avoid a personal evil, like death, by doing something unjust. And P3, the crucial premise for our purposes, Socrates claims that he would be doing something unjust and therefore doing something shameful, if he avoided death, a personal evil, by ceasing philosophy. And I want to focus on P3 here, because the question you should have is, right, in our previous video we saw Socrates say, well, philosophy is my station in life, I can't leave my post, right? This, I have a mission from the god Apollo to practice philosophy. Well, why is this? Why does he think that he has this sort of mission to practice philosophy? Where does his absolute commitment to philosophy and the philosophical way of life, where does that come from? And we see his justification for this in the following passage um, from 37e to, uh, uh, to b, where, or, or excuse me, 37a to b, where it's one of the most famous passages of the Apology, um, and it's here where he really gives an explanation for why he's so committed to philosophy. And in fact, if we engage in a careful reading, we'll actually see there are two different reasons he gives um, for this commitment. So let's just take a look at the passage, I'll break it down, and we'll talk about these different reasons. So first he says, now perhaps someone may say, but by keeping quiet and minding your own business, Socrates, wouldn't it be possible for you to live in exile for us? Okay, so he imagines someone asking, look, if you just kept quiet, stopped practicing philosophy, you could keep living in exile, you can move away from Athens, and we wouldn't bother you. Why not just do that? Okay, so Socrates says, this is the very hardest point on which to convince some of you. And that seems right. Because if the alternative is death, and death we think is one of the worst things for us, then how could Socrates be possibly so attached to philosophy? 
So he gives two reasons. The first one I have highlighted in red here. Socrates says, You see, if I say that to do that would be to disobey the God, and that this is why I can't mind my own business, you won't believe me, since you'll suppose I'm being ironical. And I'm going to call this the, div the divine authority answer. And earlier in the speech he alluded to this as well. He says, I've been ordered by the God in both oracles and dreams and in every other way that divine providence ever ordered any man to do anything at all. So remember, one of the things he took from uh, Caraphon's uh, encounter with the oracle was this idea that, well, okay, Socrates is the wisest person of all because he understands what he doesn't know, and the only way he understands that is through philosophy. And he took this to say, well, I must have a mission from the god Apollo to continue my philosophical questioning. Because I can't simply stop with the questioning I've done so far and think I'm finished, right? Because... Were I to do that, then I would be, you know, sort of resting on my laurels. I would say, oh, well, I've questioned these three people, these three groups of people. I'm wiser than all of them. I guess I can stop. But no, he has to keep doing it. He has to keep testing the oracle's answer, testing the oracle's claim that he is the wisest individual. And he can only do that if he continues philosophy. So Socrates thinks he has this mission from the god Apollo to practice philosophy. And this is the first justification he gives. I'm going to call this the divine, divine authority answer. Now, I'm going to have more to say about his other answer, but I just want to make a quick comment here, because for me, this always seems a little bit odd, in fact, of an answer for Socrates to give. Now, there are various points in the Apology where he undoubtedly appeals to sort of a divine authority, right? He talks about his daemon, which stops him from doing anything that's bad. But he clearly is someone who takes seriously what he thinks to be um, uh, divine voices or voices from the gods. But it is interesting that Socrates says this because we should remember from the Euthyphro, what was the main point of that dialogue? In the Euthyphro, we saw Socrates giving us reasons for why you can't simply trust the commands of the gods. It's not enough to just say, well... Um, the gods like this, or the authority of the gods is to do this or avoid this thing, therefore that's what I'm going to do. But the idea behind the youth of is that, in fact, we have to use our reason, we have to use philosophy to figure out what the correct thing is to do, and we can't just rely on what we think the commands of the gods are. So, for this reason, it's a little bit strange, at least to me, that Socrates appeals to his mission from the god Apollo here. Because in a sense, it seems like he's just relying on divine authority. He's saying, the reason I can never stop philosophy is simply because one of the gods told me I must continue it. Now, so there does seem to be, for me, some tension here um, between Socrates' reliance on philosophy and reason and his sort of faithful acceptance of the command of the gods. This tension, of course, is nothing new, right? It's a sort of tension that crops up in many religious contexts. So, for instance, in the Bible, there's the famous story uh, of Abraham and Isaac, right? So God comes and tells, he orders Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac. Abraham, ultimately, um, he prepares for the sacrifice. He intends to do it, even though, of course, it's a heart-wrenching and sort of horrible action to do. And God stops him at the last minute. And so if you put yourself in that position, of course, you're in a position where you're saying to yourself, well, do I trust this voice of divine authority even when it seems to me to be wrong? Or do I use my reason? And a similar sort of tension seems to be apparent in Socrates. Because on the one hand, he says, we should only act in a way, we should only live in a way we can justify through our reason. On the other hand, he says he's on his philosophical mission in the first place, because of the divine authority of the god Apollo. So I can't fully sort out that contradiction or tension for you here, but it is interesting to note. And in fact, when we look at the second answer he gives for why he's so committed to philosophy, it does seem to draw more on this idea of philosophy and reason. So look at, uh, highlighted in, in blue, the second reason here. Socrates says, but again, if I say it's the greatest good for a man to discuss virtue every day, and the other things you've heard me discussing and examining myself and others about, on the grounds that the unexamined life isn't worth living for a human being, you'll believe me even less when I say that. 
So his first answer for why he's so committed to philosophy is that the god Apollo put him on this mission. His second answer is that he's so committed to a philosophical life because were he to stop philosophy and live an unexamined life, that life wouldn't even be worth living. And this passage right here, this idea that the unexamined life isn't worth living for a human being, is one of the most famous passages from Socrates. And it's also sort of one of the guiding ideals of this course. And for that reason, we need to break this down a little bit further. What does this idea mean? What does it imply? So let's think about this passage, this idea, the examined life answer, the unexamined life isn't worth living for a human being. And there's, I would suggest there's four different questions that we really need to ask about this idea. So first question is, what is an examined life? Right? What would be an unexamined life? What is it we're supposed to be examining exactly? Okay, so for Socrates, an examined life would be a life where what you believe, how you act, right? What you think is worth pursuing in your life. You don't answer those questions merely on the basis of what others believe, what it's common to believe, what the tradition says you should believe. When you're thinking about what are the most important things in life, how should I act, what is true, you subject all those things to critical scrutiny and examination. And of course we do this all the time, right? So imagine that, um, so let's say you're going to go buy a car and you pull up to the car lot and you know there's the car salesman there. And, you know, the, the car salesman seems a bit shady. Uh, you're not really sure to trust this person. Uh, you know, he starts hyping up the vehicle, has all the latest features. Uh, has, it can do this, that, and the other. And then when you actually see the car, it looks a little beat up. Now, in this case, of course, you would say, well, I'm going to, like, think critically. I'm going to examine the claims he's making here, right? Is it really true that this is, like, a top-of-the-line car? Um, or is it... It's the case he's just trying to manipulate or deceive me. Right, whenever we think we're being taken in, we immediately sort of turn up our critical reasoning faculties, our critical thinking faculties, and we ask, is what's being said here true? And we don't just accept it on the faith of this other individual. And we do that all the time. But what Socrates is asking us to do here is not just apply that to some specific scenario where we're worried we're going to get taken advantage of or where we really need to know what's true for some practical purpose, right? I need to know whether this is a good car or not before I purchase it. He's saying we should be using our critical faculties to think about our lives as a whole. You shouldn't just accept that the proper way to live your life is the one that is suggested by um, maybe your friends and your family or your community or your uh, religious association or the political party for which your family is a part or whatever tradition um, you've been customarily raised in to live an examined life is not is simply not to just accept that the way of living suggested by that tradition is correct but it's to examine it think critically about it and say is this really how I ought to live my life now and of course for Socrates the way you examine your life just is through philosophy, through asking critical questions, in just the way that in the Euthyphro, Socrates forced Euthyphro to critically examine his life, and in just the way he did that in the marketplace in Athens, forcing the citizens of Athens to examine their lives and ask, what is really important, the pursuit of virtue or the pursuit of power, money, wealth, etc.? Now, another question here is, okay, so the examined life is a life where we think critically about what we do and what we believe, what sort of value does the examined life have? And notice the way Socrates puts it. He says, the unexamined life isn't worth living for a human being. Now, what does that mean? That means an examined life is so important that it's a precondition for having a life that's worth living in the first place. And this is actually a very radical claim. Because if you say an unexamined life isn't worth living for a human being, well, that means that if you live an unexamined life, the implication is that you might as well be dead, 
that he might as well not be living. Now, on the one hand, we see why Socrates would say this. It justifies why it would make no sense for him to avoid death by stopping philosophy. If what life is really about is engaging in philosophical questioning and examining of your own life, then what use would it be to, you know, live a few more years but give up the practice of philosophy? That's what made life worth living in the first place. And another implication we should think about here is, think about how common it is to live an examined life. I would actually suggest to you it's not very common at all if you take a wide enough perspective. Now, in some cases, that could just be because human beings, we like, you know, mental security, mental comfort. Um, engaging in critical questioning and philosophical reasoning is actually very hard. It's much easier to just believe the things that we're taught to believe, to do the things that are common to do. That's much easier. But there's also other reasons why living and examined life is actually somewhat rare. If you think about the vast swath of human history, think about how long in human history human beings have had the sort of leisure time necessary to live an examined life. Right? To live an examined life, you have to have the time to sit back and think and reflect and carefully reason about things. And of course, that's very hard to do when, for instance, you're working a 16-hour shift at the factory. Or if you... Um, need to go out and hunt and gather your food to survive. If, if what your existence is every day is getting the basic necessities you need to live to the next day, that doesn't allow for very, um, very much time for philosophical reflection. And for the vast majority of human history, all human beings were in that circumstance. All human beings were in a circumstance where there just wasn't the leisure time to do this sort of thing. And even now, right, many people, um, you know, live lives, quite unfortunately, in impoverished circumstances where nothing like the opportunity to really engage in philosophical questioning and examination is open to them. This is one reason why if really, if you get nothing else sort of out of this course or um, one thing I would like you to, to get out is a certain sort of attitude or disposition to thinking about your time as a college student. One thing I always tell students is that the opportunity you have now as a college student is an extremely rare and extremely valuable one. Because, of course, there are a myriad ways, there are many, many ways in which um, this is an oversimplification. Like, of course, people have um, jobs and families, sort of obligations outside of school, but to some extent, your experience as a college student is, you know, you've carved out a little bit of time in your life where you have some time to reflect and think about big, deep questions. And of course, a philosophy course is the perfect place to do that. It's an opportunity you may never get in your life again. Right? You know, after you've graduated and you, you're on a certain career path and most of your time will be taking up with that and family obligations and other things, the opportunity to think about seriously about questions such as, does God exist? What is the meaning of life? Where does morality come from? That opportunity will largely be gone. And so it's worth thinking about the fact that the, the fact that you're able to engage in this exercise of examining your life and thinking deeply about important philosophical issues is a rare opportunity you really should take seriously and is actually quite valuable. And what this also suggests, if Socrates is right, is that Many, many individuals, in his view, don't have the privilege and opportunity to live what he would consider to be a full human life. If a full human life requires the ability to examine our lives, then the practical needs of life for most people just prevent that. This also explains why Socrates sees himself as such a benefit to the city of Athens. Right? He told us last time that he's a benefit to the city of Athens precisely because he is there to question the citizens and force them to think about their lives. His presence doesn't let them just get wrapped up in making money, gaining power and influence in the city, worrying about their reputations. So for Socrates, the examined life is what makes life worth living in the first place. It really has the sort of highest value. Now another point I want to make, right? Um, I want to look at question three. We've 
question one and four, I think we consider together. But question three, for whom is the examined life valuable? Socrates tells us the unexamined life isn't worth living for a human being. Notice he talks specifically about human beings here, right? We can think about other kinds of beings. There's dogs and cats and zebras and frogs and horses. There's all other sorts of non-human animals. Socrates is going to say that, well, to make their life worth living, they don't really have to live an examined life. And that's because they can't live an examined life. They don't have the mental ability to look at their life in a critical way. They just, you know, for the most part, run on instincts. Um, and those instincts lead them to procreate and get food and shelter and the things they need to live. So it's a great privilege, but also a great responsibility of being a human being that you use the higher mental faculties you have to engage in this sort of process of critical reasoning about your life. And if Socrates is right, then exercising that responsibility is really the most important thing you can do. Because to live an unexamined life is just to live a life that, at the end of the day, is not quite human. Okay. And it's exactly for this reason that, after this, he tells the Athenians and the jury, he says... Again, what you're doing to me now, putting me to death, is really going to harm you more. You're, he, says, he says the following, You did this now in the belief that you'll escape giving an account of your lives. For Socrates, he sees the actions of the jury as essentially a way to get rid of him. And it's because they're tired of engaging in his philosophical questioning. They want to return to their comfort. They don't want to have to give an account of their lives to him. They don't want to have to explain their beliefs and actions. And of course, as we talked about a number of times, including all the way back to the first week of the class when we talked about the value of philosophy, it is easier to live in security than engage in the critical philosophical reasoning that Socrates thinks we should. Now, I want to finish here by looking at some of the comments about death that Socrates makes. Because the one of the things he considers is Socrates must seem a very sort of odd individual to them because he knows that at, uh, for most people at this point, if they've been suffered to death, they would be visibly shaken in front of the jury. Again, they would be bringing their friends and family in front of the jury to make an emotional appeal. He says, I've often seen people of the store when they're on trial. They're thought to be someone, yet they do astonishing things as if they imagine they suffer something terrible if they died. It would be immortal if only you didn't kill them. So first he emphasizes, look, we all have the inevitable fate of death. And he, Socrates sees it as very odd when um, someone acts as if, you know, the fact that their death is coming now is something horrible for them. And ultimately, in fact, what Socrates wants to say to the jury and also again to his friends who are distraught at the fact that he's going, now going to die, he says, I'm going to explain to you why death not only might not be a bad thing, but could be a good thing for me. He says, what then do I suppose the explanation for that? I'll tell you. You see, it's likely that what has happened to me is a good thing, and that those of you who suppose death to be bad make an incorrect supposition. Now, of course, as we're going to talk about later in this class, it is a common attitude that death is one of the most, you know, the worst thing we can suffer. And so it's striking that Socrates makes this claim. And really, there are two questions here that we have to think about. First, what I'll call the badness of death question. Is death bad for the person who dies? And two, the fear of death question. Is it rational to fear the fact that one will die? And a common sense intuition is that, first, not only is death bad for us, it's one of the worst things for us. And because of that, we should fear it greatly. And Socrates is going to attempt to show that this simply just is not the case. And this is a theme we're going to actually continue to pick up through the rest of the dialogues from Plato and also um, in the second half of the course as well. So Socrates gives a few reasons for why it makes no sense to fear death and why it makes no sense to think that death is something bad for us. He, first he says... And this comes from his commitment to Socratic wisdom, of not 
pretending you know things you don't really know. He says, you see, fearing death, gentlemen, is nothing other than thinking one is wise when one isn't, since it's thinking one knows, one knows what one doesn't know. So if you're afraid of death, if you think death is a bad thing, that seems to imply that you know what happens after death, that you know what death is like. Now, to be perfectly upfront, imagining oneself as being dead, or imagining what it's like to be dead, can be a very difficult, disquieting, and disturbing thing. And it, in part, of course, it depends on what you know, your beliefs are about what happens after death. But I, I know one thing I've attempted to do, especially when I was younger, um, was literally to imagine just myself in a state of nothingness. Which, of course, is impossible, because to imagine something, you've already <laughs> left the realm of nothingness. But it's a disturbing sort of exercise. And... I think in part, this is what Socrates is getting at. Death is so different. I mean, there's no other way to put it. Death is so seemingly different from life. It's so foreign to life. Nothingness, not existing, seems so strange in comparison to the lives we live now. That's hard for us to get a handle on it. And so when we start to think about death, we seem to imagine that we know it's going to be a horrible thing to suffer. But in fact, for Socrates, that's just another example of pretending to know something one doesn't know. And he drives this point home um, with what I'm going to call the death dilemma argument. It's an argument he makes at the very end of the speech. So he says, look, to show you that we don't know that death is bad for the one who dies, and in fact, it's quite likely death is not bad, he says, let's consider the possibilities. Because again, Socrates isn't saying he knows what happens after our death. He's just saying, um, let's consider the possibilities and reason about what they would be like. So P1, he says, we are either nothing and have no awareness whatsoever after our death, or there is a migration of our soul into the afterlife after our death. This is actually a pretty widely accepted premise, right? If you think about most people, if you ask them what happens after death, you'll usually get one of two answers. You'll either get that just the lights turn off, there's nothing, you no longer exist, all the mental activity in your brain shuts off, and that's it. Or, some people will say, well, your soul or whatever it is about you that can outlast the death of your body, it goes somewhere else, to some other afterlife. So most people accept that those are, you know, the two major possibilities. So Socrates simply wants to consider each of these. So let's first consider the, the first possibility, that you are nothing, that after death there just is simply no awareness, all your mental activity, all your experience just shuts off. He says if that's the case, then death is not bad for the one who dies. Now, keep in mind what I just said. You know, there's times where I've tried to imagine myself not existing and found it fundamentally disturbing and foreign to think about myself in just a state of nothingness, for no self to exist to the point where it just is extremely uncomfortable to think about. I think there's something to that, but look at the way Socrates draws a comparison here. He says, now, if there's in fact no awareness, but it's like sleep, the kind in which the sleeper has no dream whatsoever, then death would be an amazing advantage. For I imagine that if someone had to pick a night in which he slept so soundly that he didn't even dream, and had to compare all the other nights and day of, days of his life with that one. And then, having considered the matter, had to say how many days or nights of his life he had spent better or more pleasantly than that night, I imagine that not just some private individual, but even the great king, would find him easy to count compared to other days and nights. Well, if death's like that, I say it's an advantage, since in that case the whole of time would seem no longer than a single night. So he says, I mean, think about those times in your life when you've been really, really tired, and you're like, oh, it would be amazing just to go to sleep immediately, have a nice dreamless sleep. During the day, you know, you know, that at some point you're going to, you're, you're going to go to sleep later. And think about your attitude toward the fact that you're going to go to sleep later. You never find yourself fearful of it. You're not like, oh my gosh, I'm going to go to sleep later, it's going to be horrible, um, I'm going to experience nothingness. No, you never say anything like that. Now, from your first-person subjective personal point of view, what is different about a dreamless sleep and death? Death simply is, on this 
possibility we're considering, the ceasing of all experience. Right? Not experiencing anything. And of course, that's just what a dreamless sleep is. Laying there, unconscious, not experiencing anything. You may have had times where you've had surgery and you've gone under deep anesthesia. Now, you may have had some fear about, oh, is something going to be messed up? But put that aside, you probably didn't fear being in the state of being unconscious. That probably wasn't fearful to you. So, if we don't fear being asleep, if we don't be, fear being um, under anesthesia or being unconscious in general, then why do we fear death like it's some sort of horrible thing that happens to us? It simply just doesn't follow. So Socrates says if that's what death is, then it doesn't sound so bad. Now, I'd be very interested to hear what we think about this premise. This is actually something we will, an idea we will pick up on later in the course, uh, in the second half of the course, when we talk a little bit more about the nature of death and the badness of death. But no matter what we think about this premise, it at least is somewhat comforting, um, and it might at least have some effect on the extent to which we fear death. Because sometimes, when you think about the way in which people are afraid of death, the attitude we commonly take toward death, it seems to suggest that what we think is going to happen is we're going to go somewhere to be t horribly tortured. But in fact, that simply doesn't follow at all. On this possibility, at least, there's no reason to think that we're going to um, be suffering in that sort of way. So even if death is bad for us, it doesn't quite seem that we have a great reason to fear it if Socrates is right here. But let's consider the other possibility. P3, so Socrates imagines, well, if there's a migration of our soul into the afterlife after our death, then death is not bad for the one who dies. And I won't read through the whole passage here where he explains this, but basically he says, um, if my soul is going into the afterlife, well then, this seems like it'd be a great benefit. Because now I'll have the opportunity to continue philosophical discussion with all the great heroes and thinkers of the past. And of course, this is just what he was doing in his entire life, is engaging in just that investigation and critical examination of his life. So he says, I could spend time examining and searching people there, just as I do here, to find out who among them is wise and who thinks he is but isn't. So he's, in fact, if that's the case, he would be looking forward to death. Because he'll be able to continue his practice of philosophy with some of the greatest minds that have ever walked the earth. And of course, this is sort of an instructive point as well, because um, many religious traditions hold that after our deaths, there's an afterlife which is sort of paradise or a, um, an eternal communion with the divine. It's something positive, according to many religious traditions. And again, if that is the case, it's strange why we have such fear of death or why, in fact, we think death is such a bad thing for us. Now, I won't say too much more about this argument. I really want to see more of what you have to say in our discussion. And there's a couple things to think about here. Regarding P2, is it actually the case that death isn't bad for us if we have no awareness? Is there some sense in which being unconscious permanently can be bad for us in some way, even if it doesn't feel you know, painful and we're not being tortured or something like that? And P3, what about this idea of a soul migrating into the afterlife? and continuing his practice of philosophy. Are there any other possibilities D doesn't uh, consider? Has he really necessarily shown that on both of these possibilities, death is not something bad or not something to be feared? Again, I'll be interested to see what you have to say on those points. Okay, so I am going to stop the video there. Again, I hope this was useful, helpful, and at least somewhat entertaining, and I will see you in the next video.